Turn to me in Psalm chapter 27, verse number 4. Psalm 27, verse number 4. I want to be reading from the Amplified Bible this morning. And I want you to listen very closely because I come to you with a heavy heart in a good way. If that makes sense. A heavy heart in a good way. Now what that means is this, 
So many people, when it comes to their relationship with God, their walk with God, they, they, they try to do things in a fleshly manner. In other words, following their fleshly desire, their fleshly wants, and those certain things. But are we going to do that, or are we going to come to the place that we allow the Spirit of God to fill us to the point in our life that we satisfy Him, we follow Him, and we do His will, not Something to think about this morning is it? Isaiah chapter 10, verse 27 said, The yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing. Oh, how often, David, have I stood upon that verse, knowing that the yoke and the powers of hell and the opposition to the enemy brains and all the different things that we face, the yoke is destroyed by the power of the enemy. The yoke represents anything that hinders, binds, or oppresses. Now let me ask you this morning, don't raise your hand, but let me ask you, have you been hindered this last week? Have you felt bound this last week? Have you been oppressed this last week? Let me tell you where you've been. You've been under a yoke. Amen? Now let's go a little further. It can be sickness. It can be a mental sickness, an emotional sickness. It can be a physical sickness. It can be a disease. It can be a death. It can be, a, it can be life. It's happening in your life. A yoke can come in many different forms uh, and it can be presented in many different ways. The yoke represents anything that the devil can put on you to steal your joy. Amen? 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 Amen. Amen. You folks are too quiet today. Amen? Amen? There you go. The yoke can represent anything that the devil can put on you to steal your joy, to rob you of the abundant life that Jesus gives. And that's exactly what the devil wants to do, and that's his job today. Amen. But I want you to hang with me this morning. Then he talks about the anointing here in this verse. The anointing breaks Satan's power. The anointing delivers the bound and the oppressed. The anointing brings healing to the sick and the diseased. The anointing brings freedom from our infirmities. I want to help somebody right here. So often we think about infirmities, we think about sickness, we think about disease. But let me tell you what infirmities are. Infirmities are weaknesses. Amen? Amen. I said infirmities are weaknesses, which means he brings you freedom from your weaknesses. The things that hold you bound that you've fallen weak to, that you don't have strength to overcome, the anointing will break the power of those weaknesses off of your life and help you get free. Amen. When nothing else you're doing and nothing else you're trying and nothing else you've been a part of has been able to free you or get you through it, the anointing will break the yoke of it off of your life. But I want you to listen to me very well. You can copy it, you can imitate it, but you cannot manufacture the anointing of God. Amen. And I want everybody in this room to hear this. A lot of people are trying to copy it. A lot of people are trying to imitate it. But you cannot manufacture the anointing. It only comes through a relationship and an experience with the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 There's only one place the anointing comes from. Fellowship and communion with the Holy Ghost. Yeah. Now I may say Holy Spirit part-time, Holy Ghost part-time, but they're both the same. He is the key ingredient. He is the master key that the church must have today. Amen? Amen. Amen. If we, the church, are going to be pleasing to God the way God wants us to be, we're going to have to have the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. If we as individuals are going to be fully pleasing to God the way God wants us to be, we're going to have to have the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Now, does that mean you can't be pleasing to God if you've been saved, but yet you don't have the Holy Ghost yet? No, it doesn't. You can be, you can be pleasing to God when you've been saved. Mm -hmm. Amen? You are pleasing to God when you've been saved. But what I want to get across to you, how much more can you be pleasing to God when you go all the way and get full of the Holy Spirit? Why? Because when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, He brings an anointing to fulfill your calling, to fulfill your purpose, to fulfill God's design in your life, and to help you go deeper than you've ever gone before, and to help you go higher than you've ever gone before, and help you do more for God than you ever dreamed you could do. So it's important. Amen. I believe that without the power of the Holy Spirit, 
The church is going to become just another casualty of war. Somebody hear me out today. War is happening around this world. We get that, don't we? We watch it on the news. We see what's happening in Israel. We understand war is happening all around. But I got news for you. There's a war going on in the church. I said, there's a war going on in the spirit realm. There's a war going on in the spiritual way. And I'm going to say these to you, so the war against the enemies of hell. And if we don't have the Holy Spirit of God, I'm afraid we're going to become casualties of that war. Either we're going to be saturated, inundated, and due with power from on high, and we're going to fight back through the power of the Holy Spirit, or we will end up more casualties on the battlefield of life. I'll give you my hand here. We will fight back to the power of the Holy Spirit, or we're going to become casualties on the battlefield of life. I don't know about you, but I refuse to become a casualty. I said, I refuse to become a casualty. I said, I refuse to become a casualty. We are, if we're going to have the power of the Holy Spirit, we must learn how to host. How often does the Holy Spirit show up but people don't know what to do with it? How often does he show up and people don't know how to react, they don't know how to respond, they don't know what to do? We've got to learn to host the presence of God's Holy Spirit. When he comes, we got, oh, I feel healed. Can I tell you in our worship today, we were hosting the presence. And can I tell you, as we were worshiping this morning, we were hosting the prison. But can I tell you what I liked about it even more? As our worship went up, we were lifting up a seat to God, saying, come down, Holy Spirit, and sit among us, dwell among us, move among us, saturate us. But how often in the world we live in, people don't know what to do with him. They don't know how to respond to him. Let me just say this to somebody in this room. When the Holy Spirit shows up and he begins to reign in the house and you don't know what to do, let me give you a little piece of advice. Don't try to figure out what to do. You just stop right where you are and you just surrender. And if you don't know what else to say, you just say to the Lord, God, I surrender all. God, I surrender all. God, I surrender all. And when you begin to surrender yourself into the hands of the Lord, can I tell you that's when he begins to reign upon your life? And you may not understand it. You may not know it all. But don't try to figure it out. You just let God be God. And not only will he feel you, he'll teach you. He'll lead you. He'll guide you. He'll direct you, oh God. I want you to hear this next statement I want to make to you this morning because it's very important. Our aim and our goal in life as Christians is not to be. Let me back up and say it this way. Our aim and our goal in life as Christians has got to be more than the rapture. I got a lot of men over here. Our aim and our goal as Christians has got to be more than the rapture. Can I take that further? Our aim and our goal in life as Christians has got to be more than going to heaven when we die. Amen. That's all some folks are concerned about. Just going to the rapture and going to heaven when they die. I want to tell you, those are awesome, those are wonderful, and those are a must. But God sent me by to tell this church today, our aim and our goal in life has got to be more than just going to the rapture or making heaven our home. Our aim and our goal in life as Christians also has to be twofold. Number one, we got to know Him. Because yes. you can't go into rapture if you don't know Him. You can't go to heaven if you don't know Him. You with me? So our number one has got to be knowing him to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and to have fellowship and communion with the Holy Spirit. Our number two goal has got to be to make Jesus known in the earth, to be a living revelation and a manifestation of his will in this earth. So let me back it up and say it like this. Number one, we got to know him. Number two, we got to let Jesus know. And as we get to know him, that's when we get ready to make heaven our home. I'm going to say it again. You can't make the rapture if you don't know Jesus. You can't make it to heaven if you don't know Jesus. 
Jesus. You gotta have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Yeah. Jesus didn't make disciples just so they could go to heaven. I'm gonna mess some people up today. It make it quite a mess for it's over with. Jesus didn't just make disciples so they could go to heaven. He made disciples to multiply himself in the earth. He made disciples to manifest himself through them. He made disciples to heal the sick, to cast out devils, to raise the dead, and to do miracles. That's why he made them. You with me? So listen to that. If that's why he made them, can I tell you, that's why they needed the Holy Spirit. That's why they had to have the Holy Spirit. Because it could only come through the anointing of God that would operate in them, through them, and about them. And that being said, can I tell you, that's why we need the Holy Ghost. That's why we have got to have the Holy Spirit of God operating in our lives today. Amen. It's the Lord and the Holy Spirit that gives us power over the devil's kingdom. Stand your feet all across this room. Put your hands together and give God the best thing about it. Come on, let's you Expression. 
In other words, you got to want him. And I'm going to say something to help you. Be very careful. A lot of people say they want him. When they come down from the rubber meets the road, they really don't. Because they don't want to do what is required to give place to him. But we have to come to places in our life that we have to make up our mind that we want the world or we want God. We want what the world has or we want God has. Amen? Amen. Number three is accommodation. If you want the Holy Spirit to live in the presence of the Holy Spirit, you've got to make accommodation. This goes further than the first two. To accommodate means to make comfortable, to seek to please, to create a desired environment. By extension, it means to consult with Him, to have the desire to please. Now, the beautiful thing about the Holy Spirit is, and I love this, he is a perfect gentleman. Amen. The Bible tells us that and it lives out to be true. He is a perfect gentleman. You know what that means? He will not come where he is not invited. Amen. I said he will not come where he is not invited. He will not live where he is not welcome. And he will not do what you do not give him the freedom to do. Amen? Amen? In other words, he's not going to force himself on anybody, but he will come where he is welcome. Now let me make a couple of things very clear right here. Are you listening? The Holy Spirit is not just tongues. I just messed some folks up right there. Because when they get to seeking the power of the Holy Spirit, they're worried about the tongue. What are they going to say? What are they going to do? What's going to come out of their mouth? What's the word going to mean? That's the initial evidence, but that's not all there is to him. The Holy Spirit is not just tongues. The Holy Spirit is not just power. The Holy Spirit is a person with power. I said the Holy Spirit is a person with power. And if we want the power of the Holy Spirit, we got to learn to host the person of the Holy Spirit. And we got to learn to live in the presence of the Holy Spirit. So you got to host him and then you got to live in him. If you really want to be a part of your life, the more comfortable we make the Holy Spirit with us, the more His power is going to be manifested in us, through us, and about us. So let me ask you, is the Holy Spirit comfortable to come where you are? Good question, isn't it? I say, is the Holy Spirit comfortable to come where you are? Now I'm going to shift gears here and take you a little different direction. How do you create the environment that the Holy Spirit desires? Okay, Pastor, we got to live in the presence of the Holy Spirit. We need to live in Him. Well, how do I create an environment where He want to come? How do I create myself where He want to come? Listen to this very closely. Number one, eliminate sin. Eliminate sin. What does it mean? Shut the door on Satan. You remember the message not long ago? Slam the door. That means give no place to the devil. Stop doing anything that's contrary to the word of God. Amen. If you haven't heard anything else from right here, listen to this very close. To live contrary to the word of God is sin. Amen. I got a cup of salt. <laughs> but we know it's true. To live anything contrary to the word of God is sin. Sin is disobedient to God's law. Amen. Am I right? Amen. I know I'm right. But it's anything living contrary to God's law, if you will. So number one, if you're going to create an environment, you got to eliminate, you got to get rid of sin. You have no place to devil. Number two, you got to be quick to repent. When you have done something wrong contrary to the word of God, listen, or even contrary to the voice of your conscience, repent. This is important. So often people sin and they do things against God and they just let it ride, let it ride, let it ride. The longer you let it go, the harder it is to return from it. I hope somebody just heard me. I said the longer you let it go, the harder it is to return from it. If you feel pricked in your heart, that's the Holy Spirit trying to keep you safe, trying to hold you back, trying to keep you in place. Amen. Repent quickly. Amen. You know what that means, Robert? Keep short accounts with God. Put it under the blood of Jesus Christ. God never said we'd be 
be perfect. God never said we wouldn't make mistakes. God never said we wouldn't mess up. But I want to declare this to you today. If you sin, put it on the blood. If you fail, put it on the blood. If you fall short, put it on the blood. Don't let it keep writing. Put it under the blood. When the Spirit of God convicts your heart, convicts your spirit, put it under the blood. Keep short again. If you want to create a place where the Spirit of God is going to come, the third thing you got to do is crucify compromise. I want everybody to listen to me right now. You know what that means? Make no deals with the devil. Amen. I'm going to say that again. Make no deals with the devil. And I'm going to say this while I'm here. Some of you need to quit listening to the devil. Some of you need to quit letting the devil hound you on a daily basis. Some of you need to quit listening to the lies of hell. And you need to get back into the word of God and start reading the saith the word of the Lord. And let me just give you some here. The next time the devil starts whispering in your ear, start quoting the word of God out your mouth. And if you can't quote it, the next time he starts whispering in your ear, pick up your Bible and start reading. So let me say it again. Crucify, compromise, make no deal with the devil. Leave no gray areas concerning your commitment and your obedience to God. No gray areas. Let me give you something. You're either in or you're not. There is no in between. You're either in or you're not. There is no gray area. So I'm going to say it again. You got to leave no gray areas concerning your commitment. You know what that means? You got to let the devil know who you are. You got to let the devil know what you believe. And you got to let the devil know where you stand. And you got to let you know what you believe. And you got to let you gotta let you know where you stand. And you got to let the world know what you believe. And you got to let the world know where you stand. No gray areas in your commitment. No gray areas in your obedience to God. That means never compromise your faith. And never compromise. Isn't it funny how some people can do one thing when they're in the presence of one group of people and they can be something else in their presence of another? Let me tell you where God's called us to. It's to be who you are no matter who you are. You may be in this group of people and they may make fun of you, they may laugh at you, they may mock you, they may put you down, oh, they may go on. Serve like you do. They love the Lord like you do. They're living like you are. But be who you are. Be the same here as you are here. Be the same here in the middle as you are here. Amen. What am I trying to tell you? Never compromise your faith. Never compromise your faith. Because whatever you give, the devil will take. Amen. I said, whatever you give, the devil will take. The next thing is if you want to create an atmosphere where the Spirit of the Lord will want to come, you got to minimize. This is to me very close to that. You've got to minimize the secular. What does it mean? For many, the secular things of life have taken precedent over the abiding presence of the Holy Spirit. And it's important. The secular is not sinful <coughs> or evil. I just blew somebody right out of the water. But listen to me close. The secular is not sinful or evil. It's just excess. But here's what happens. Instead of praying, we're appeasing the secular. Instead of reading the word of God, we're creating we're appeasing the secular. Instead of worshiping, we're appeasing the secular. Instead of doing the things of God, we're appeasing the secular. Well, God sent me by here with two words for you. Stop it! I'm going to say it again. Stop it! Because if we're not careful, the secular things of life will become more important than the God things of life. It may 
not be sinful. It may not be evil. But if it's something that's drawing you away from God and away from the presence of God, and it's something that's pulling you away continuously, let me tell you what it's doing. It's tearing you down and it's driving you away in your relationship with the Lord. So we have to come to the place and realize don't allow anything. It may not be sin. It may not be evil. It may not be a wrong thing. But don't let anything come between you and your relationship with God. Number five. If we're going to create an atmosphere of the Spirit of God, we want to come. And this one's important. Trash the demonic. Tap your neighbor on the shoulder and say, you better listen to this one. Trash the demonic. What does that mean, Pastor? Be very aggressive against anything demonic or a cult. Be very aggressive against anything to monitor authority. Destroy anything that even leads toward the occult or the demonic. Why? Because any of such nature brings the Holy Spirit. Whenever you allow something like that into your life, into your home, into your family, wherever it is, it brings the Holy Spirit. And let me just stop and tell you this. I've said it very often, but I'm going to say it again today. Be careful what you let in your house. Be careful what you let come, come across your television set. Mamas and daddies, you better be aware of what kind of games your kids are playing on their cell phones. You better be aware of what kind of things are being brought into your house. Because I'm going to tell you, you may think it's innocent. And you may think some of these things don't really matter. But can I tell you, the devil can come into a cell phone. He can come into a TV. He can come into a radio. He can come in all different manners. Be careful what you let in your house. I'm going to tell you something going to mess some people up in this church. You may think I'm crazy, but it's okay. <coughs> My wife and I, we enjoy sometimes going to yard sales. Just, just to talk. You all know sometimes we enjoy going to the fruit store now. Just to go. Just something different to do. Let me tell you what happens. When we buy something, we don't know where it comes from. We've laid hands on every bag and everything. And this is the way I pray. God, if there's any, anything demonic, if there's anything of any demonic possession, anything that's been on any of this stuff in any way, God, you break it off of it right now and you remove it in the name of Jesus. And let what is here be a blessing to our family. Let it be a blessing to our life. Let it be a blessing to our home. Now somebody said, oh, Pastor, that's kind of far-fetched. And no, sir, no, ma'am. Because I'm telling you, I want to be careful what I let come in my house. I want to be careful what I let come in my life. I want to be careful what I let in my house. Let me go talk to the Holy Spirit in here. Are you listening to me this story? you got to be careful. Why? Because anything that grieves the Holy Spirit, it will give demonic spirit. If you allow demonic things to come into your house, it will give access to demonic spirits, demonic pressure, and demonic activity in your life or in your home. And you may not even recognize that it's happening until it's too late. Almost makes you want to go home and anoint your house all over again, doesn't it? Think about it this morning. And I'll just tell you, if the Holy Spirit lays it on your heart to do that, do it. If we truly want to live in the presence of the Holy Spirit, we will cultivate an atmosphere that He desires. Now, listen close. You may ask, well, how do I cultivate an atmosphere or an environment for the Holy Spirit to come? Number one, praise Him and worship Him. Yes. You want the Spirit of God to come? Praise Him. You want the Spirit of God to come? Worship Him. You want the Spirit of God to come? Recreate an atmosphere for Him. He inhabits the praises of His people. That's not my word, his word. Second thing you got to do is meditate on the word of God. Why? He lives in his word. Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. All scripture is inspired by God. Second Timothy chapter 3, or 3, 16, Amplified Version. All scripture is God breathed. What does that mean? He lives in his word. If you want the spirit of God to come, praise him. Worship him. Get in his word. Get in the place where he lives. And number three, get into a place of solitude with him. The Bible said in Psalm 46 and 10, be still and know that I am God. You know why some people can never hear 
hear from God because they never get still enough to listen. You know why some people never hear the voice of God? Because they never stop long enough to listen. I'm going to tell you something I learned as a Christian. I used to feel like every time I get, on, get to a place of prayer with God, just me and the Lord, I had to talk. No, 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 no. And if I couldn't think of something to say, I'm going to praise the Lord, hallelujah, glory to God, bless the soul of man. If I couldn't think of anything else to do, I'm just rattling something out of my mouth. And one day I had to come to the realization that how in the world can I hear God when my mouth's always moving? I'm not saying don't pray. You got to pray. You got to see God. But sometimes you got to be still. You got to close your mouth so that you can know He is God. So that your ears can get in tune. So that you can hear thus <coughs> said the word of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Matthew chapter 6, verse 6, New King James. But you, when you pray, go into your room. And when you have shut the door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. You know what that means? That means get alone with God. Get in that place of solitude with Him. You begin to pray. You begin to seek the Lord. When the time gets right, then you can get quiet. Let the Spirit of the Lord speak to you. But you're in that place of communion. You're in that place of connection. You're drawing close to the Lord. Let me give you something. If you want the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life, the number one thing you must have is spiritual hunger and thirst. Amen. 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 I want you to look over the and say, are you hungry? Look at it again and say, are you thirsty? This is important. James, James, oh, excuse me. Matthew chapter 5, verse 6. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be what? For they shall be what? Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. One of the most painful and yet important things that many must become aware of is this. They have been living too far away from the power of One of the most painful things that can happen to a child of God is to realize they've been living too far away from the power of God. When we think we're a-okay, we think we're in the right place at the right time, when in reality we've been living too far away from the power of God. And it could be because of we, what we've allowed to come in. It could be because of what we've allowed ourselves to be a part of. It could be because of what we've got connected to. Or it could just simply be that we haven't been seeking it could just simply be that we haven't been praying. It could just simply be that we haven't been in the Word of God. It could just simply be that we ain't been alone with the Lord. But what a horrible thing to come to place in life that you've been living too far away from God's power and didn't even know you were that way. For that reason, the devil has been running rampant. He's had free reign in many people's lives doing anything that he wants to do. But I want you to hear this statement and hear it very closely. God is ready to grant us the power to shift the momentum of the church and to put the devil in his place. I said he is bringing us the place to, to shift the momentum of the church and put the devil in his place. Now listen to me. God grants his power to those he trusts. He grants his power to those who are intimate in relationship with him. He grants his power to those who love his presence. He grants his power to those who seek his face. So let me back up here. Do you trust him? Are you infant him? Do you love his presence? Not just what he can give you, but his presence. Are you seeking his face? Or are you always seeking his hand? Think about it. God gives his Holy Spirit to those who are seeking him. The key to victory moving forward is Learning how to abide in him. The key to victory. 
that's a big statement right there. I said that's a bold statement right there. To live every day in the presence of God. Let me take you back to where we started. In Psalm 27 and verse 4, David said, One thing have I asked of the Lord, and that will I seek. Inquire for it, and insist it be required. That I may dwell in the house of the Lord in his presence.